thanks to uh, uh, thanks to one of our devotees uh, sushil ji and uh, michael uh, we are starting a new format uh, of uh, the sunday satsang uh, let me try and paint a picture for you so from from this sunday onwards uh, mr michael james will be talking to us about updesh saram and he and he will be going through all the 30 verses uh, a brief background even though most of us would know of it murugunar the poet devati was uh, was writing in tamil the story of the wayward rishis of the daruka forest who were practicing special rites for attaining powers that they so much desired their egos were deflated by shiva and perceiving the error of their approach they humbly sought spiritual instruction from shiva shiva graciously bestowed the instruction and it is these teachings that murugunar requested bhagwan to reveal in verse form hence marshi composed these 30 verses in tamil later bhagwan translated them into sanskrit a tamil version is titled updesh undiyar and the sanskrit version is entitled updesh sara and it is also referred to as updesh saram mr michael james i would now request you to please take over and uh, and guide us namaskaram i'll start by saying a little bit more about uh, the background of upadesh undiya that is um murugana composed a great work called ramana sanidhi murai um it is a collection of um of hundreds of uh, i can't remember how many uh, many hundreds of verses in praise of bhagavan he the, though it is very original in content in the, the uh, literary style murugana mo- modeled it on uh, a, a number great work of tamil called dilthirvasakam by uh, manika vasaka so many of the uh, songs that are in tirvasakam in the same style Mur- murugana composed songs on uh, bhagavan because in murugana's view um, the same lord shiva who appeared uh, uh, under a tree in tiruparundurai to manika vasaka the same lord shiva lord arunachya shiva appeared for our benefit in the form of bhagavan ramana so murugana saw no difference between shiva and bhagavan ramana in fact um uh, murugana saw all gods as nothing but bhagavan ramana um as is clear, as is i'll explain a bit more um so one of the songs in tiruvasakam is uh called uh, tiruvundia um it's a particular style of uh, song every verse ends if, if the second and third line of each verse ends with the word uh, undipara which basically means jump and fly it is, was probably either a song a style of song for a particular type of country uh, rural dance or maybe a children's game it's not it's not n- now known the origin of this but anyway this was the style of a burst that manika vasco composed one song and in that song he told various leelas of lord shiva so as i say in um in murugana's view bhagavan is lord shiva himself but all the different names and forms of god uh, murugana considered to be um manifestations of bhagavan that it was bhagavan who appeared in the form of so many gods so murugan actually wrote two uh, tiruvundiyas the main one the largest one tiruvundiya one he told the leela he told leelas of um vinayaka uh subramania and various avatars of vishnu including um rama and krishna and so it was bhagavan in the form of krishna who taught the bhagavad gita for example he says and um then he uh, told various shiva leelas um saying it was bhagavan in the form of shiva who did all these there's also a much shorter um uh, tiruvundiya 2 in which he briefly tells the uh, story of um 
Jesus dying on the cross and of Buddha uh, teaching the Buddha Dharma. And he says it was Bhagavan in the form of Jesus who died on the cross for the, to uh, cleanse the world of its sins. And it was, uh, um, it was Bhagavan in the form of Buddha who taught the Buddha Dharma. So in, Bhagavan, in Murugan's view, it's, everything is Bhagavan. So um, among the leaders of Shiva that he told, the last of, uh, of, uh, of several leaders of Shiva that he told, uh, he narrated in this song, in the first Tirugundiya, that is, that is, he concluded with the story of the Darakavana Rishis. The Darakavana Rishis, though they were called Rishis, they were actually, um, they were not great sages, they were very much attached to karmas. They, um, and they were performing karmas in the, um, in the Darakavana, that's Daraka forest, um, in order to gain uh, the fulfillment of their desires. They wanted power, they wanted to, to go to heaven after the death of the body and everything. They, they had so many, so many worldly desires. And for the fulfillment of their worldly desires, they believed their karmas um, were, could give them whatever they wanted. And they were very proficient in doing their karmas as prescribed in the Vedas. So um, uh, Murugana told this story, and then when it came to the point where Lord Shiva, who to, re to remove the delusion of these uh, um, the, these rishis and their attachment to karma, Lord Shiva appeared before them in the form of a mendicant, and um, he was a uh, Vishnu accompanied him in the form of Mahini, and. Um, the rishis, seeing the beauty of Mahini, they were uh, they forgot about their karmas and they started following Mahini, and Lord Shiva appeared as a as a young man, um, as, as a naked mendicant walking uh, through the forest, and the wives of the rishis, they were actually much better than the rishis because they were um, they were very. Uh, faithfully serving their husbands, so they have more humility than their husbands. So when they saw this divine uh, figure of Lord Shiva in the form of a mendicant, uh, they were attracted by his divine luster, and so they started following him. When the rishis came to know that their wives were following this naked mendicant, they became very angry, forgetting their own mistake. But they were they had were deluded by the beauty of this uh, Mohini. They thought their wives were deluded by the physical beauty of Shiva, but actually they were deluded. They they were attracted by his divine beauty, not his physical beauty. But anyway, they were very angry. Um, so they wanted to punish this. Uh, this mendicant. So they, start, they started various yagas and yagnas and released various weapons upon him. Um, but whatever weapons were released, because that mendicant was Lord Shiva himself, the karmas are powerless before him. So whatever weapons were released, he took the serpent and wore it round his neck as a garland. He took the, the tiger and um, wore its skin as a, a garment. He, the elephant that was sent on him, he, he, um, he took its skin also. And like that, all the different weapons that were, um, that were released from this yaga, were, he easily subdued them. Then only the rishis understood that there's a power greater, higher than their karmas. So it's at that point that they become humble and they fall before they fall at his feet and pray for him to give them spiritual teachings. Murugana deliberately brought the, the, the story to this point because he thought this is a very good opportunity to ask Bhagavan to express the teachings that uh, Lord Shiva gave to those uh, those rishis. And since the rishis were deluded by karma, he knew it would be an appropriate place for Bhagavan to, to repudiate the philosophy of the uh, Purva Mimamsa and to assert the philosophy of Vedanta, as I will explain in more detail. So, um, so Bhagavan composed 30 verses, which are Upadesha India. 
for recitation, Bhagavan also from the, there were, before Upadesha's story, uh, Undia began, the, the story of, um, of the Darkavana Rishis, it goes from verse 70 onwards. So from verse 70 to 102 is the story. Then Upadesha Undia, and then uh, some five concluding verses. So Bhagavan took from the story, Bhagavan took the first two and the last four verses as an upagatam as introductory verses, and Murugana composed a Pairam. Pairam means a, a prefatory verse. What Murugana sang in his Pairam is Karma Mail Tindu Gatikana Neri Muriin, Man Mail Huiha Varunga Enna Son Muruga Ende Ramanan Tohutu Tindu Upadesha Undia Nyana Vilakor. What that means is this Upadesha Undia, no, but this Upadesha Undia is a light of Nyana that our father Ramana composed and gave to Murugana, who said, For the world to be saved, giving up the delusion of karma, tell the secret of the nature of the path to experience liberation. So, this is important because this is that, that is the main that, that is the, the starting point. The point from which uh, Upadesha Undia starts is to firstly to remove the delusion of karma, because by karma, karma is finite. Karma means action. All actions are finite. So whatever be the fruit of actions, they are also finite. So by no amount of karma can we attain liberation? Because liberation is infinite. Im liberation is our real nature. So uh, karma, uh, liberation cannot be attained by karma. So, so long as we are attached to karma, that is a great delusion. So it's first necessary for Bhagavan to remove this delusion of karma. So that's why Murugana begins this verse, karma mayal tindu, removing the delusion of karma, gatikana neri murian, the nature of the path to attain, uh, or gatikana literally means to see liberation, or to, that means to achieve, attain liberation, the secret of the means to attain liberation so that the world may be saved. This is what Murugana prayed to Bhagavan for. So this is the context. It's important to bear this in mind, but the context is to remove the delusion of karma and to show the way to liberation. That means the way to liberation is not karma. So since we cannot attain liberation by doing anything, how to attain liberation? It is only by being. And how to be? This is what Bhagavan teaches us in Upadesha India. Uh, so this is the context. And the Upagatam, the first two verses in particular are important because it, it, it's setting the scene. That is, in the first verse of uh, Upagatam, Daruka Vanatil Tavam Saidirindava Purva Karmatal Undipara Pokare Poina Undipara. What that means is those who were doing tapas, austerities, in the Daruka forest were going to ruin by purva karma. Purva karma means, uh, purva there refers to purva mimamsa. Purva mimamsa is, a, is a, a system of philosophy that interprets the meaning of the Vedas, and it gives importance to karma. And according to purva mimamsa, karmas are supreme. There is nothing, no power higher than karma. So, they don't even have regard for God. If you do the karma, the karma has to give its fruit. So the karma is supreme. So in the next verse, um, Murugana um, expresses the attitude of these uh, of these rishis who, and this is the this is the one of the basic ideas of the Purva Mimamsa philosophy. Karma te andri kadaval ile ennam, vanma van mata ayena undi para. Uh, ban, banja, uh, banja serikina undipara. What that means is, um, karma te andri kadavali lay. That is, their, their belief was there is no God except karma. So, the meaning of the whole verse is because of the delusive conceit, uh, 
They became intoxicated with intense pride that there is no God except karma. That is, if we give importance to karma, if we think karma is supreme, karma is action. It requires a doer. Who is the doer of action? It is ego. So we are, we are elevating ego. We are boosting ego. If we believe in the power of karma, we are boosting ego. Particularly if we believe that there's no power higher than karma. So they were so... They were so egotistical. They, they thought our karmas are the highest power there is. There's not even a God who can overrule the power of our karma. So if we do karma, it will definitely bear fruit. Such was their arrogant attitude. And then the story goes on. I won't go, I've, I've given a brief outline of the story, but um, yeah, Lord Shiva comes to remove that pride. This is the, the context of Upadesh India. Why I say all this, is it's important to understand this because this sets a context for the, um, for the, uh, for the, uh, for particularly for the early verses of, Up of Upadesha India, which uh, Bhagavan also translated into Sanskrit as Upadesha Saraha. So I, um, I must confess, I am not an expert in Sanskrit. Um, but I'm, uh, with the help of uh, dictionaries and so on, I'm able to understand, because I understand the meaning of the Tamil original, it is relatively easy for me to uh, uh, understand the meaning of these verses of Upadesha uh, Sara, uh, uh, which, um, which Bhagavan, uh, the, the Sanskrit version. Um, I think actually when... Um, Bhagavan first composed Upadesha India in Tamil. Then I think some Telugu devotees asked him to compose in Telugu. So I think the first translated version was Telugu. The second, then Bhagavan translated into Sanskrit. And finally, he wrote in Malayalam. The Malayalam version is interesting because Bhagavan wrote in a longer meter. So here and there in the Malayalam version, uh, Bhagavan added words which... Um, which casts more light on the verses. So occasionally I may refer to a Malayalam version for that reason. But the, the most complete version is the Tamil version. Because Bhagavan wrote the Sanskrit version in a somewhat shorter meter, um, it, there are certain important ideas in Tamil that are not explicit in Sanskrit. So I will often refer to the Tamil version to clarify what is meant by what Bhagavan meant in the Sanskrit version, but it's the Sanskrit version that I'm going to be talking about from, from now onwards. So, um, in the first verse, Bhagavan says, Kartaragnya prapyade palam karma kim param karma tachadam. The meaning of that is that if we split it, first we have to do the panachetam. Kartu, uh, kartuha, uh, agnya prapyate palam. That means, palam means fruit. That is referring to a fruit of action. Uh, prapyate means it is obtained. So fruit is obtained, agnya, by the order, kartuha, of the doer. But kata literally means the doer. It's God is often referred to as the doer. Not that God actually does anything. As Bhagavan clarified in verse in the 15th paragraph of Nana, God is not actually a doer. God, by the mere power of the special nature of the, of the presence of God, everything that is to be done, it happens automatically. So God does everything without doing anything. Um, as Bhagavan would often express things, uh, Bhagavan had a, was very fond of saying, uh, um, uh, seeing without seeing, speaking without speaking, doing without doing. That meant by his mere being, everything happens as it's meant to happen. So when God, though God is referred to as the doer, it, we shouldn't take it, but he's literally doing anything, but everything is happening as it should happen by the mere power of his presence. So in that sense, he is the doer, not that he actually ever does anything. The nature of God is pure being, not doing anything. Um, so it is, 
the, the why this first line is so important, the 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 those Darakavana rishis um, uh, believe that karma is supreme, but uh, but there's no power higher than karma. If you do a certain karma, it will have a certain fruit. That is that is um, that is. It is bound to have its fruit. So if you do the karma, you're bound to experience the fruit of that karma. That that was their belief. That is the Purva Mimamsa philosophy. One problem for Purva Mimamsa philosophy was how to explain if you do a certain action, supposing you do a yaga here in this world, how to explain that that gives you happiness in heaven after this, in the next world. Um, what is the what is the logical or causal connection between the karmas that you do here and the the fruit that you experience in a later life there in heaven? So uh, to explain that, because Purva Mimamsa didn't want to admit that God ordains the fruit, that God gives the fruit of karma, they they used the word adrishta. Adrishta means unseen. They said there's some unseen power that connects the cause with the effect. The cause is the karma. The effect is the fruit of the karma. So there's a, an unseen connection. Uh, so that the, the term they used was adrishta. Adrishta means what is not, uh, what, what cannot be seen. You cannot see it, but there is a connection with their belief. Um, I think this term, I, I don't know about other Indian languages, but certainly in Tamil, uh, um, this term, the, the Sanskrit term adrishta becomes adishtam in Tamil. In Tamil, adishtam means luck. So, and I think it's, I, I believe it's the case in many other Indian languages, but it's used in the same way. Uh, but uh, if, if some good fortune comes to you, that is your, your, your that is adrishta. That is, that's the, the origin of that. Uh, of the way the term is used now in modern Indian languages is from that Purva Mimamsa philosophy. But what is that adrishta? They couldn't say. It's something unseen, but there's an unseen connection between the fruit and uh, the, uh, between the action and its fruit. Um, Vedanta um, repudiates this idea. It, according to Vedanta, Karma has no power of its own to give fruit. It gives fruit only as ordained, uh, as, as allotted by God. So whatever fruit we, are ex we experience, that is the fruit selected by God as the appropriate fruit for us to experience at the appropriate time. So the, uh, the law of karma, according to, um, according to Vedanta, there are three karmas. Agamya, Sanchitta, and Prarabdha. Actually, of these three, only Agamya is a karma. It's strictly speaking, it, only Agamya is uh, an action. The, the Sanchitta and the Prarabdha are karma pala. They're the fruit of action. They're the consequences of action, the moral consequences. So if you do a, if you do a bad action, the moral consequences of that bad action is a... Is a you, you'll have to suffer as a consequence. If you do a good action, you, you get some pleasant experience. But since the actions are finite, the fruit are also finite. So if you live a very, very bad life, you may in the next life be in hell. But hell is not unlike the, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian, uh, that, that, that is the, the, the Abrahamic religions. They believe heaven or hell are eternal. If you live a bad life, you go to hell and your eternal damnation. If you live a good life, you go to heaven and you're eternally with God in heaven. That is their idea. That is not a very sophisticated idea because whatever good we do is finite. Whatever bad we do is finite. So according to the, the Dharmic conception, that is all the Dharmic religions, um, what are nowadays classified as Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Sikhism, their view of heaven and hell are quite different. If you do bad actions, you may go to hell for some time. But in hell, you experience the fruit of your action. Once the fruit is experienced, that's over. You then have to come back to this lifetime to have another, uh, to 
uh, to this uh, human life to um, to uh, live another life. So heaven and hell, according to um, according to Vedanta, in fact, according to all um, all. All, all, all of the Dharmic religions, they are just temporary states. Um, so, uh, but I'm coming back to Vedanta, the Vedantic view is that there are three types of karma. The first type of karma is the agamya. Agamya means the actions we do as, in accordance with our own will. But whatever actions we willfully do, those actions have fruit. And the fruit of those actions get stored in sanchitta. Sanchitta means a heap or pile. So because in each lifetime, if we ex in each lifetime we experience one lifetime worth of fruit. But because we have our uh, generally speaking, our desires are far greater than anything that we can experience in most. In most cases, in each life, we experience, we accumulate far more fruit than we are able to experience. So, uh, sanchitta is a huge pile. It's there's so many fruit of past actions, but we haven't yet experienced. Um, so, from that huge pile, that uh, that sanchitta, God selects those fruit which will be most appropriate for us to experience in this lifetime. That is, what of a fruit that will be most conducive to our spiritual development, those are a fruit that God allots for prarabdha for each lifetime. So the prarabdha is, is a selection of the fruit of our past actions that have been allotted to us by God for us to experience in this lifetime. That, this is why God is called the doer. In, in this sense, but he allots for fruit of actions. But he doesn't. He doesn't actually allot the fruit of actions by doing anything. By because God, God is our own real nature. God is, and what we actually are is infinite love. So just by being what he actually is, in other words, being the infinite ocean of love, the infinite ocean of grace, by his mere being. Everything happens as it should happen. So the fruit of actions are, by the mere special nature of the presence of God, the fruit of actions are allotted, appropriate fruit. What is the most appropriate fruit? This is why Bhagavan often used to say, whether you call it prarabdha or God's will, it's the same thing. Because though the prarabdha is the fruit of actions that we've done in the past, it's fruit that have been selected by God as being the most favorable fruit for us to experience in this lifetime. This is why sometimes we see very good people, even great saints, they have to suffer a lot in this life. People who have a, who have a naive understanding of, um, of the law of karma, they think, oh, a person suffers a lot, they must be a very bad person, if a, because, that's a, because they've done so many bad actions, therefore they're experiencing a miserable life. Whereas those people who have a very favorable life, who have wealth, health, um, power, social status, all these things, these must be very good people, not necessarily the case. You may be a very bad person, but seemingly have a very, from a materialistic point of view, you may seem to have a very favorable uh, prarabdha. You may have uh, lots of wealth, lots of po political power, lots of social status. All these things may come. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good person. You've done lots of good karma. You may have done only a few good karmas. God has selected those, the fruit of your few good karmas for you to experience in this lifetime for your spiritual betterment. Because when, you, when we experience all these material things, if we experience wealth, health, um, uh, social power, uh, political power, and all these things, we will not be satisfied with them because nothing can satisfy us because what we actually are is infinite happiness. Infinite happiness is our real nature. So nothing short of infinite happiness can satisfy us. So however uh, favorable our life is from a worldly point of view, it will not satisfy us. So sometimes it's necessary for us to experience all favorable things in order to understand, but we cannot obtain happiness from these things. So 
we don't know why God gives which fruit to which person. So we need not be concerned about that because whatever fruit God gives us to experience in this lifetime is what is most favorable for us. So whatever we, whatever fruit of action, whatever fruit we experience, that is whatever we experience in this life is the fruit of our past action selected by God and allotted for us to experience in this lifetime. Since it's selected by him, it is his will and it is what is most beneficial for us. So we, whatever be our prarabdha, whether it's favorable or un, from a perspe worldly perspective, favorable or unfavorable, we should not be concerned. Whether our life is full of, of suffering or full of pleasures, we shouldn't be concerned. It's all his will. Whatever be, as Bhagavan sings in verse 2 of Arunacha Patikam, ninishtam enishtam, your will is my will. Imbedaku, that is happiness for me. So we shouldn't desire anything other than his will, because he knows what is better, what is good for us, more than we know. So we should we should joyfully accept whatever whatever befalls us in this life is given to us by him for our good. So we should accept it joyfully. This is only if we are willing to accept whatever happens as his will, are we ready to begin to follow the path of, of surrender? That is, the path of surrender begins with accepting his will, joyfully accepting his will. So since whatever happens in our life is his will, we should, whatever be our, our, um, our prarabdha, whatever be the fruit allotted to us to experience in this lifetime, we should joyfully accept it. Um, so this, what Bhagavan teaches us in this first line, Kataragnya prapite palom is a very, very important teaching. The fruit of karma, that the karma cannot bear fruit except by the uh, ordain uh, the ordinance of the order of God. So it is it is God, whatever fruit we experience, these are the fruit that have been selected by God and allotted for us to experience in this lifetime. So um we we need when we do an action, the fruit it's out of our hands. If you if you um, shoot an arrow, before you shoot the arrow, you can aim it at the target. But once you've released the arrow, it's no longer in your hand. If you if you didn't point it correctly at the target, if you pointed it somewhere else, it's going to go somewhere else. So the, just just like an arrow. A shot from a bow is no longer in, under the control of the archer. When we do any action, the fruit is no longer in our hands. It is in God's hands. So whatever fruit we experience, it's entirely up to him. He knows what is the appropriate fruit for the appropriate karma. So these Darakavana rishis and the Purva Mimamsa philosophy, they are very, very naive. They believe if you do a certain action, if you do this um, this Vedic ritual, this uh, yaga or yajna, if you do it in the prescribed manner, it will have to give uh, a certain specified fruit. Um, that is not the case. It's entirely, the fruit of action is entirely in God's hands. Once we've done the action, it's out of our hands. So we need not be concerned about the fruit of action. Why? Because it's safely in God's hand. Whatever fruit he gives us is what is beneficial for us. Um, then but in the next, uh, in the second line, there are two sentences, a question and an answer. Uh, the question is, karma kim param? Uh, kim is uh, here just functions as a, as a, uh, as an interrogative particle. So, uh, Karma param would mean uh, karma is supreme. Karma kim param, it makes it a question. Is karma supreme? Param here refers to God. So um, in Tamil, Bhagavan says, um, um, karmam kadavalo, is karma God? Uh, so so um, param here stands for God. Uh, in other words, is it the supreme power? The supreme power is God. Uh, uh, karma tatjadam. Karma is jada. Uh, jada means it is not aware, it's not sentient. Karma has no power of its own. But 
it has no power to give its own fruit. It gives fruit only according to the order of God. So this verse is a repudiation of the uh, of the philosophy of Purva Mimamsa, as embodied by the Darakavana Rishis in, that, in this story. Um, so it, it, this is why the story is very important to understand this, um, to, to, I mean, this verse can be understood fully only when we understand it in the context of the story. So what Bhagavan is telling us here is that the fruit of action is entirely in God's hands. Karma has no power of its own. Karma is not God. Karma, karma yields fruit according to the will of God and the will of God alone. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is the first verse in which Bhagavan is just saying, karma itself is insentient. It's God who decides what fruit the karma should give. So there's no automatically, if you do this karma, you'll get this fruit. It is not so. You do a karma, God decides what is the appropriate fruit for that act, uh, that uh, karma. Um, so this is, this is a far more sophisticated understanding of the, the, the Vedantic understanding of karma, the Vedantic understanding of the law of karma is far deeper and more sophisticated and more correct than the Purva Mimamsa view of karma. The Purva Mimamsa view of karma is a very, um, a very, um, a very naive, a very um, childish view of karma. If I do this, I, have, I get what I want. It's not, <laughs> life doesn't work like that. The karma doesn't work like that. We, whatever actions we do, it will bear fruit, but the fruit is in the hands of God. And even the fruit gets stored in Sanchita. When, where, and, and whether we will, ever, we will ever experience the fruit of karma is entirely in, in God's hand. Some people who, some of the, some non-Vedantins, when they talk about karma, they say all the good karma and all the bad karma has to be has to balance out, or that's one way people express it. Or sometimes they say you have to experience all the fruits of your past karmas. That will never happen. We, we it's impossible because we always accumulate. As a general rule, we accumulate more fruit than we experience um, than, than we can experience in each lifetime. So, and whatever. Whatever actions we do in this lifetime will not bear fruit in this lifetime. It will go to Sanchitta from where it may be selected in some other lifetime. So we can never exhaust Sanchitta. According to Vedanta, how we free ourselves from karma is not by exhausting Sanchitta, which would be impossible. But what is the root cause of karma? Root cause of karma is ego. Ego is the doer of karma and the experiencer of the fruit. As Bhagavan says in verse 38 of Uludunapadu, if we are the doer of actions, we will experience the ex resulting fruit. The doer of action means, um, it means e ego. Um, and the ego is both the doer of action and the experiencer of the fruit. Why, how is ego the doer of action? Because as ego, we always identify ourselves as this body consisting of five sheep. So the three instruments of action, uh, body, mind, speech, and body, these instruments we experience as ourselves. So whatever actions are done by mind, speech, or body, we experience it as I am doing this. And therefore, we are the doer of actions, and consequently, we have to experience the resulting fruit. So as what Bhagavan says in verse 38 of Uludunapadu is, if we are the doer of action, we will experience the resulting fruit. Investigating who is the doer of action, when one knows oneself, doership will depart, and all the three actions will uh, slip off, all the three karmas will slip off. This is the state of liberation, which is eternal. That what that means is, the, the all the three karmas exist only for ego. Ego is the doer of the agamya, and the, the experiencer of the fruit, which is the sanchitra and pra prarabdha. 
Of course, Sanchitta, we don't experience until it's allotted as prarabdha, but we experience the fruit of our past action as prarabdha. So we are both the doer and the experiencer. If we investigate ourselves, who is this doer of action? In other words, who am I? The, we will thereby know what we actually are. When we know what we actually are, we will know that we, we, are, not the, we are not this body consisting of five sheaves, which, was, which are the instruments by which we do action, we are just pure being. When we know ourselves as pure being, we will cease to be the doer. So the doership and experiencership will depart, and hence all the three karmas will come to an end. So it's all dependent on ego. Um, so uh, that is, I so far talked about the, the, the first verse. Now, Coming to the second verse, Kriti Maho Dado Patanakaranam Palamasaswatam Gati Nirodakam. This is um, basically um, three sentences, um, but, but, but it's expressed in a very um, in a very compact way. The first line is uh, one sentence. Kriti maho dado patanakaranam. This sentence is a sentence just with a subject. <laughs> what, is the, what is this referring to? We have to understand by referring back to the Tamil. That is, the first line means uh, Kriti maho dado means in the great ocean of action. Patana means falling. Karanam means cause. So the first sentence is simply the cause of falling in the great ocean of action. What is the cause of falling in the great ocean of action is not specified here. Because as I say, Bhagavan wrote this Sanskrit version in a shorter meter. It wasn't a possible for him to include everything. So we have to understand what, it, what he's referring to here. Fortunately, we, we don't have to, we, we are not left in any doubt because we simply refer to the Tamil version. In the Tamil version, what Bhagavan says is, um, um, he begins the Tamil version, actually, uh, the order of sentences is different in Tamil. Um, the first clause in Tamil is Vinayin Vilebu Vilebutru. That means the fruit of action perishing. What that implies is the action, the fruit of action is impermanent because if we experience, once we experience the fruit of any action, that fruit is finished. We can't experience the same fruit uh, again. That is, if you, we can understand this with, uh, uh, with uh, physical fruit. If, I, if, I, if someone gives you a mango, you can't eat it today and keep it and eat it again tomorrow. Once you've eaten it, it's finished. <laughs> if you have just one mango, if you eat it, you have no mango. So likewise with the fruit of action. When we experience the fruit of action, it comes to an end. But then the, the most important word in the Tamil version is the next word, vittai. Vittai means as seed. That is, it is the sea, the seeds are what causes us to fall in the ocean of action. Vittai vine kadal virtidam. It is the seeds that cause us to fall in the ocean of action. What are those seeds? The seeds are vasanas. In fact, in the Malayalam version, Bhagavan says, vasana kara vittai. That means uh, as seeds in the form of vasanas. So vasanas means our inclination. The inclination that causes to fall in the ocean of action our vishaya vasanas. Vishaya vasanas means our inclination to experience any vishaya. Vishaya means anything other than ourselves. Because we have ex inclination to experience vishayas, in order to experience the vishayas, we need to do action. So the vishaya vasanas uh, uh, are expressed as a, or a vishaya vasana is also what is called a karma vasana. Because um, the karma vasana is the expression of the vishaya vasana. Why do we do any action? Because we want to experience some fruit. So it is the, it's the vishaya vasanas that lead us to action. And those actions that we do under the sway of our vishaya vasanas are what are called agamya. So, and agamya are the actions that bear fruit. So, this is why it is the. the 
the, 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 as I said, but Sanchitta and Prarabdha are just the fruit of actions. They are the effect. They are not the cause. The cause of, the, of that fruit, what gave right, what, what yielded the fruit, is, or what gave rise to the fruit, is the agamya. And what causes us to do agamya? It is the Vishaya Vasanas. When we allow ourselves to be swayed by Vishaya Vasanas, our attention moves away from ourselves towards other things. That is mental activity. That all mental activity is a movement of our attention away from ourselves towards other things. And uh, mental activity gives rise to activity of the speech and uh, body. So all karma, is, all uh, agamya is by definition those actions that we do under the sway of our vasanas. So vasanas are what cause us to fall in the great ocean of action. So though Bhagavan doesn't specify that here, this is what we need to understand. In some translations I've seen it put, but um, action is the uh, cause of uh, falling in the ocean of action. Um, that is like saying, uh, I mean, <laughs> there must be, the, the ocean of action is the, the problem. What is the cause for our falling in the ocean of action? We can't just say action is the cause. It, there, there must be a deeper cause. In some translations, it put the fruit is the cause of our, our falling. But the fruit, as Bhagavan says in the next sentence, palamasa swatam, the fruit is impermanent. So the karma is, 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 goes on perpetually until we deal with the root of it. Uh, so the fruit is impermanent. So the fruit can't be the cause. The fruit is the effect. So it is neither the karma nor the fruit that causes us to fall in the ocean of action. It is the seeds that make us do the, the under whose sway we do our gamya. That is what causes us to fall in the ocean of action. And those vasanas are whose vasanas? They are ego's vasanas. So Ultimately, the ultimate cause is ego. But when we rise as ego, the very nature of ego is to have Vishaya Vasanas. Because as Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, um, he describes e ego there as a Uruvatra Paya Hande, a formless phantom ego. And he explains the nature of this formless phantom. Uh, Urupatri Undam, uh, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri Nikkam, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri Undu Mika Ongam, grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. Uruvitu Urupatram, leaving form, it grasps form. So from these four sentences, what are we to understand about the nature of ego? The nature of ego is to be always grasping form. Without grasping form, ego cannot come into existence, stand or flourish. What does he mean by grasping form? Since ego itself is a formless phantom, whatever forms it grasps are things other than itself. In other words, vishayas. What he refers to there as form is vishaya of any, any type of vishaya is a form. So vishayas means objects or phenomena. Anything other than ourselves is a vishaya. So because it's the nature of ego to grasp vishayas, in other words, they'll constantly be attending to and seeking to experience Vishayas. Ego has but the very nature of ego to have Vishaya Vasanas. Vishaya Vasanas means the inclination to attend to those Vishayas, to attend to and experience those Vishayas. So it's the having Vishaya Vasanas is the nature of ego. Ego is not the Vishaya Vasanas, but it's the nature of ego to have Vishaya Vasanas. So the, the root cause of the of our falling in the ocean of action, as soon as we rise as ego, the nature of ego is to have Vishaya Vasanas, and therefore we do a Gamya and we fall in the great ocean of action. That is why Bhagavan indicates in verse 38 of Uludunapdu, as I said earlier, but the means to free ourselves from action, the only means is to put an end to the doer. Uh, uh, e ego. And we can put an end to ego only by investigating ourselves. Ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself, an awareness of ourself as I am this body. This body means the body consisting of five sheaves. So uh, ego is the adjunct mixed awareness I am. When we, uh, when we investigate ourselves, we are investigating the essential 
I am portion of ego. In other words, our, our own being. What is real in ego is only I am. The adjuncts, this body, are, are unreal. So if we are in order to investigate what ego actually is, we need to hold on to the reality of ego. The reality of ego is I am. When we hold on to I am, the adjuncts drop off and I am alone remain. This is why in the next sentence, in the fifth sentence in this verse 25 of religion, Abdu Bhagavan says, Tedinal otum pidicum. That means if sought, it takes flight. What he means by if sought, if ego, instead of grasping things other than itself, instead of grasping form, if it tries to grasp itself, if it turns its attention away from other things back towards itself, it will take flight. Take flight is a poetic way of saying it will subside and dissolve back into its source because ego rises, stands and flourishes by holding things other than itself, by grasping form. If it tries to grasp itself, it thereby lets go of all forms and it subsides and dissolves back into its source. So this is the means for liberation. So this is how we get rid of karma. But anyway, coming back to this verse two, as I say, in the first line, he says, Kriti Mahoda do Pasana Karanam, the cause of falling in the great ocean of action. The implication is that the Vasanas are the cause of falling in the great ocean of action, as he says explicitly in Tamil. The fruit are impermanent. So we shouldn't be concerned about fruit. If we experience the fruit, it's finished. And moreover, once we've done the action, the fruit is no longer in our hands. It's entirely in the hands of God. So we let God take care of the fruit. Let us not be concerned about the fruit. What we need to be concerned about is the seeds that cause us to do the action but bear the fruit. The seeds of Abbasana, we need to avoid being swayed by our Vishaya Vasana. So long as we allow ourselves to be swayed by the Vishaya Vasana, we are drowning more and more in this great ocean of action. So in the last uh, sentence of this verse, Bhagavan says, Gati nirodakam. Gati nirodakam literally means uh, liberation obstructing. What that implies is doing action of any sort is not a means to liberation. It, is, it uh, obstructs liberation. In Tamil, he says, Vidu tarile, it does not give liberation. But in Sanskrit, he says even more forcibly, it obstructs liberation. That is, so long as we are doing karma, we are going in the wrong direction. We are allowing ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasana, but take our attention away from ourselves. In order to attain liberation, we need to stop being swayed by the Vishaya Vasana. We can avoid being swayed by Vishaya Vasana only by holding on to ourselves, only by holding on to I am, which is not a, which is not a Vishaya. I am is our own reality, our own existence. So when we hold on to our own existence, we cease doing and we remain just as being. Being is the means to liberation, as Bhagavan makes clear in later verses. Then, so these first two verses, Bhagavan is pointing out liberation. The fruit of karma is entirely in God's hands. And, but, and liberation cannot be the fruit of a karma because karmas are finite, so they cannot give liberation. If you, if you allow yourself to engage in action under the sway of your Vishaya Vasanas, you'll be just drowning more and more and more in the great ocean of action. And you'll be experiencing the fruit, the fruit are impermanent, but though the fruit are impermanent, so long as you continue doing the agamya under the sway of Vasanas, you're accumulating more and more fruit. There's no end to it. We, to put an end to it, we need to stop rising as ego. We can stop rising as ego only by investigating ourselves. While I notice that while I explain these verses, I'm referring to so many other teachings of Bhagavan, what Bhagavan says in Uludunapdu and elsewhere. The reason for this is we need to have a coherent understanding of Bhagavan's teachings. To understand any any verse of Bhagavan, we need to understand it in the context of so many other verses because they all hold together as a coherent whole. So the meaning of the verses, the implication of the verses, of any of his verses, becomes much clearer when we consider it in the light of other verses because the other, e each verse throws more light on each other verse. So we, this is why under, 
studying Bhagavan's original writings in, um, uh, is, is so important. Even if we can't understand the original language, having a good translation and thinking deeply about it and understanding each verse in the context of all the other verses, then we get a clear and coherent and complete understanding of these teachings, which is very important because merely by understanding all these things, we're not going to attain liberation. But the more clearly we understand what Bhagavan has taught us, the clearer the practice will become to us. That is why Bhagavan taught all these things, was to impress upon us the need for the practice. And what is the practice? The practice is not doing anything, because doing is, is karma. The practice is not doing anything, it's just being. Attending to anything other than ourself is a doing. Attending to ourself is a cessation of doing, it is a being. Um, uh, so the last verse I'm going to talk about today is verse 3. Um, how I plan to proceed with these early verses. Today, I'm going to be talking about verses 1 to 3. Next time, I'll talk about 3 to 8. The reason I talk about 3 um, both today and next time is that 3 is the first of a series of verses. It's also a connection between that series and the previous two verses. So the previous two verses are incomplete without this verse. And this verse then leads on to the next sequence of verses. So um, doing one to three, and then three to eight, and then eight to ten is, a, is, a, is an appropriate way to divide up the, the first ten verses. Because the three is a link between verses one and two and verses um, uh, uh, four to eight. And eight is a, a suitable link between the previous verses and uh, nine and ten. So that's why I will divide them up in this way. Um, what Bhagavan says in um, verse three is, Ishwara pitum nechaya kritum chitta sodakum mukti sadakum. Um, this is all one um one sentence, but it's, it's put very, very briefly. Sadhu often used to say Bhagavan's verses uh, in Tamil or Sanskrit, that he, he said in many places, it's like telegram English. In the old days when people, before we had emails and texts and all these things, if you wanted to send an urgent message, you would send a telegram. But because you had to pay for each word or each letter in the telegram, it would be... Uh, telegrams would be written in uh, in a very uh, compact way. So this is like like telegram English. Bhagavan's uh, Sanskrit or Tamil verses are like that. So, uh, but but we we have to under, we have to expand it to understand the meaning. So literally, what this means is Ishwara Pitum means offered to God. Uh, Necheya Kritum that means is Na Icheya Kritum. Not done with desire. Chitta sodakum means mind purifier. Mukti sadakum means liberation accomplishing. So the whole verse is, if we translate it literally, offered to God, not done with desire, um, uh, mind purifier, liberation accomplishing. So what this implies is action that is not done with desire, but offered to God, um, that in other words, we, normally when we do action, we do it wanting some result, wanting some fruit. We, if, if, I, um, if we go to the office every day to work, why do we go to the office every day? Because we want our salary at the end of the month. And why do we want our salary? Because we want to uh, take care of our family and so on. So we, we do action with a desire for a certain fruit, normally. So what Bhagavan is talking, in the previous verse, he says action obstructs liberation. So can action play any role in enabling us to attain liberation? This is what Bhagavan is explaining here. If we do action, instead of our action being motivated by desire for any fruit, if we do action offering the fruit to God, in other words, we're not doing the action for any for deriving any benefit for ourselves, we are doing it only 
for God. We are offering the fruit of the action we offer to God. In Tamil, what he says is, um, uh, nishkarmiya karma. that means nishkarmiya karma that is done for God. And in the Malayalam version, he's even more explicit. He says, Ishwara priti and I. That means done for uh, it, he, he, that means for the love of God. So when you do an action for God, that means you're doing it for the love of God. So but Nishkarmiya Karma, we it is possible to do Nishkarmiya Karma only to the extent to which we have love for God. Because normally any action is motivated by a desire. In order for action to be not motivated by desire, we have to do it purely for the love of God. It's only for God's sake that we do whatever actions are given to us. So if it's our prarabdha to have to say be married, we we have we are married, we have a family, we've got certain responsibilities to take care of our family. So we, we discharge our duties as a family person. Not for what we gain from it, but just for the love of God. Then it is nishkarmiya karma. Or supposing it's our destiny to be a sannyasi. Sannyasis also do actions of some sort or other. Even if it's sitting in a cave meditating, that's still an action. But it, that action should not be for attaining any personal benefit. It should be done just for the love of God. So whatever action we do, we shouldn't do it with an eye on the fruit. We shouldn't be concerned about the fruit of the action. The fruit of the action is God, God's hand. We do the action just for the love of God. That is nishkarmiya karma. So one important thing to understand from this verse is, often it is said, there are four different paths. Uh, karma maga, bhakti maga, um, uh, uh, yoga marga and um, jnana marga, or uh, another way of expressing this is um, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, uh, raja yoga, and jnana yoga. Bhagavan doesn't take uh, karma marga to be separate from bhakti marga. The, as we will become clear when we go through further verses, Bhagavan takes the preliminary practices of bhakti. Anishkarmiya karma, that is whatever puja, japa, and dhyana we do, we must, if we do it without desire for the fruit, but just for the love of God, that is nishkarmiya karma. And Bhagavan often used to say, only an apanyani can be a good karma yogi. That is, whatever karma yoga we do, it's inevitably there'll be. We, because as an ego, we always have some likes and dislikes. We, we cannot do per, nishkarmiya karma perfectly. To the extent to which we have love for God, we can do nishkarmiya karma. We can do actions just for the love of God. But the nishkarmiya karma will become perfect only when ego is eradicated. That's why Bhagavan often used to say, only the jnani can be a perfect karma yogi. So karma yoga isn't about doing. It's about not having desire for the fruit. It's about doing whatever is done, whether, whether we do action or we don't do action. It's only for the love of God. If the love of God is the key to nishkarmiya karma, so long as and, uh, until the ego is eradicated, and then whatever action is done is automatically nishkarmiya, because who, who has all the desire? It's only ego. So um, action with, without desire um, is possible only to the extent that we have love for God. So karma, nishkarmiya karma is not a separate path. It's the beginning, it's the early stages of the path of bhakti. And so the, this action that is done without this, uh, or that is not done with desire, but offered to, but for the love of God, offer, the fruit offered to God, you're doing it only for God, not for, the, for the, whatever fruit you can get from it. That is chitta sodakam. It is uh, it's a mind purifier. It purifies the mind. In other words, it it, it, it will purify the mind. Uh, mukti sadakam. It, it is a liberation accomplishing. It, what that implies is it will thereby indirectly uh, enable us to accomplish liberation. It's not a direct means because, as Bhagavan said in the previous verse, karma cannot give liberation. In in Tamil, how he expresses this, he says, uh, Gati vari kaam become. It shows the way to liberation. 
uh, that is, so long as our mind is impure, we think only in terms of action. When, when we are faced with any problem in life, oh, what can I do to uh, solve this problem? So we always we are always looking for means to do something in order to achieve something. Liberation cannot be achieved by doing anything. But in order to understand that liberation is, can be achieved not by doing anything, but by just being, we need a certain degree of purity of mind. So the nishkarmiya karma will purify the mind and thereby give us the inner clarity to understand what is the means of to liberation. That's why in Tamil Bhagavan says it shows the way to liberation. And how does it purify the mind? It purifies the mind because the, what are the impurities in the mind? The impurities in the mind are the Vishaya Vasanas. The Vishaya Vasanas are what prompt us to do action in order to experience fruit. If we, if we do action not for the sake of any fruit, but just for the love of God, we, we are not being swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas. We're being swayed only by our love of God. So because, because our our focus is on God. We are, whatever we do, we do just for the love of God. So it's with the thought of God that we do whatever we do. It's for his sake that we do it. So our mind is being directed towards God and not towards whatever we can get from the action. So we are thereby weakening the Vishaya Vasanas and strengthening the love for God. Um, but... Even that is imperfect, so long as we take God to be something other than ourselves. But Bhagavan, but Bhagavan is taking us through a step-by-step -step process here. He's clarifying this. So there's a lot more to be explained in, in later um, I, 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 as we go on. And I'll be often referring back to this verse 3, because this verse 3 is the, is, is, that, the, the, the context of all the of verses four, five, six, and seven is clear only from the perspective of three. And even the, the, the significance of verse eight becomes clear. Where in verse eight, he says, what is best of all? We had to refer back to three to understand what he means by best of all. So this verse three is a pivotal verse here. So as I say, I'll talk about it next time in more detail. Um, before I finish... Um, there was one other thing I was asked to, um, uh, before uh, someone suggested, but I talk about Tupadesha Sara for the next, um, well, for a series of meetings. Um, someone had asked a question, that is Harish Subramaniam had asked two questions, actually. So I will try and answer those questions now. Sorry, I haven't left much time for it, but I, I will do my best. Um, the first question Harish asked is, how do we know if we are doing the practice correctly? Here, I believe he's referring to the practice of self-investigation. Bhagavan called this path the path of Atma Vichara, self-investigation, or Jnana Vichara, investigation of awareness. When you're investigating something, when you start on an investigation, the way forward may, may not be very clear. You start off with a few clues and you, you begin to investigate. As we go deeper in the investigation, the way be forward becomes clearer and clearer. So this isn't a, this isn't a, though we can describe this practice of self-investigation as meditation. Sometimes Bhagavan refers to it as surupa dhyana, meditation on our real nature or, uh, Ananya Baba, meditation on what is not other. We are meditating only on ourselves. But this meditating on ourselves is an investigation. We are attending to ourselves in order to see what we actually are. So our aim is to know who am I. So we are investigating ourselves. We are attending to ourselves with the intention to know who am I. In order to follow this properly, we first need to understand that it, the preliminaries, before we can start practicing self-investigation uh, properly, we first need to have a little bit of theoretical un or a little bit of uh, conceptual understanding. That is, uh, self-investigation means attending to ourselves. 
But what is meant by ourself? What is this self we have to attend to? So first we need to understand. Now, what we take ourselves to be now is this bundle of five sheaths, this body, life, mind, intellect, and will. These five collectively we take to be ourself. I am this person, such and such a person. This person consists of what? Body, life, mind, intellect, and will. So uh, this person, as so long as we take this person to be ourselves, if we ask to attend to ourselves, we'll be attending to this person. But this person is not what ourself is. This is why the, 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 um, the Advaitic teachings generally begin with neti neti. We first we need to understand what we are not and why we are not that. So we are first we we need to understand, but we are not this body or life or mind or intellect or will. These are all objects. We are a subject. So we do drikdrisi vivaka at least uh, uh, conceptually. We 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 distinguish ourselves from other things. So all these five sheaths are objects known by us. We are not an object. We are the subject. So we are that which knows all these. So we we first we first need to have this conceptual understanding. But we are not anything that appears or disappears. We are the awareness to which all these things appear and disappear. So once we've understood that we are that fundamental awareness, which is what is sometimes called referred to as witness. The witness, actually, witness in the sense of the perceiver is ego, but the reality of ego is the is the pure awareness I am, which is also metaphorically referred to as witness, though it doesn't actually know anything other than itself. In that deeper sense of the term witness, Bhagavan said, "Witness sakshi means sanity. Witness means just the presence, the mere presence of our ourself." Um, but in the in the sense of the witness as the perceiver, that is ego. So we first need to distinguish ourselves from the five sheaths. We need to understand. But what we are investigating is not any of these five sheaths. It's only the I that is aware of itself as I am these five sheaths. So uh, what we are to investigate is only I. In, we investigate I by only by attending to I. We can't investigate I in any other way. We can't. We have to investigate anything other than ourselves. We need the mind. We need um, the five senses. We need instruments to know things other than ourselves. But to know ourselves, we don't need any instrument because we ourselves are Swayam Prakasa. We are self-shining. So we are. We always know ourselves as I am, even when ego doesn't rise. And ego rises and. Uh, flourishes in waking and dream. In sleep, there is no ego, but we are still aware I am. So uh, what we actually are is only that fundamental awareness I am. So we need to understand that. So what we are investigating is only this fundamental awareness I am. And how do we investigate it? Only by attending to it. So in order to know if we are doing the practice correctly, we need to understand the we we need to understand Bhagavan's teachings correctly. If we understand Bhagavan's teachings correctly, we will understand that we are not any we are not anything other than that fundamental awareness I am. That is when the first question Shiva Prakashan Pillai asked Bhagavan was Nan, Nana, who am I? Bhagavan answered Aribe Nan, awareness alone is I. And then he asked, what is the nature of that awareness? Bhagavan said, Satchidananda. So the, the awareness that we actually are is not the awareness that knows other things. It is the awareness that is just being. The, the, the awareness that is Sat and Ananda. That is the, 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 it, it is not awareness of things. It is the awareness of just being. That is the, our awareness of our own being. In other words, the awareness I am, that is the awareness that we have to investigate. So we can investigate this awareness I am only by attending to it, only by being. And since we are self of that, it is being self-attentive. So if we understand correctly, if we've got a correct conceptual understanding of Bhagavan's teachings, it will be clear to us what the practice is. The practice is not attending to any object, but attending to that 
fundamental awareness in which all objects appear and disappear. That is the fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. So if we understand the teachings correctly, we will understand the practice correctly, and it will be clear to us that we, what is the correct practice? It is just being self-attentive. And how do we know that we are making progress? Very simple. If you're doing, if you're trying to attend to yourself, you're making progress. If you're not attending to yourself, you're not making progress. So we progress simply by attending to ourselves. Attending to ourselves is not a doing, it is just being. Because we know ourselves just by being ourselves. We don't have to do anything to know I am. Whether we're doing things or not doing things, we are always aware I am. So in order to be aware of just I am and not of anything else, we need to, we need to focus our entire attention on ourself alone. Attending to ourself is not a doing, it is just being. Attending to anything other than ourself is a being, it's a karma. That's where these verses come in, uh, uh, are so important. These early verses where Bhagavan says, we cannot attain this by doing anything. Karma will only obstruct liberation. Karma can be, uh, can begin to help us get out of this only if it is done without desire and for the love of God. So, so long as, how do we know whether we're making progress? So long as we're attending to I, so long as we're trying to be self-attentive, so long as whenever our attention goes outwards, we try to bring it back to ourselves. Well, whatever may appear, to whom does it appear? It appears to me. So we turn our attention back to ourselves. So, so long as we are trying to keep our attention fixed on ourselves, and whenever it goes away from ourselves, trying to bring it back, we are making progress. In practice, most of us, are still uh, our love for this is still very insufficient. So much of the time we are attending to other things instead of attending to ourselves. But at least as much as possible, we should try to attend to ourselves. Every moment that we attend to ourselves, we are making progress. So let us try and attend to ourselves more and more and more and more. This is the way to escape from all karma to escape from this great ocean of karma, it is only by clinging to our being that we can get out of this ocean of doing. So this is, Bhagavan's path is so simple, so direct. Instead of being concerned about doing, now we are drowning in this great ocean of action. How to avoid being drowning in this great ocean of action? Hold on to our being. Our being is that fundamental awareness that is always shining within us as I am. Let us hold on to that awareness of our own being. That is the way to escape from the great ocean of action. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arnachala Ramanaya. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, and on behalf of Raman Kendra Delhi, a heartfelt gratitude to, for taking us through Updesh Saram. Well, and, it's all... Uh, it, it's all Bhagavan is taking us through it. It's not me because he has gone. He has he has put the railway track. We are just the the train is just to run along the railway track, and he will lead it along. The, even to what is the power that leads us along this railway track that he's he's laid out for us? He is the power. So let us just surrender ourselves to him. He will make all these things clear to us. Very well said, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a quick point, next uh, time, Michael, we will be taking up verses four to eight, or would it be? No, three to eight. I'm going to repeat three, three, three it. because it's an important link between these first two verses and the next uh, sequence of verses.